personality crisis. Today's sermon is based on the classical text from the wonderful punk band, the New York Dolls. Chapter 1, Personality Crisis, verses 1 through to 20. And lo, David Johansson did scream, Personality crisis, you got it while it was hot, but now frustration and heartache are all you've got. Ooh, 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 ooh. <laughs> A quick scan through the lyrics seemed to affirm an accusatory position regarding, I'm guessing, a former girlfriend. Words such as butterflyin', celebrity, celebrity and prima ballerina pepper the song. One is left with the distinct impression that said lady might have been a little bitch. Although this being the late 70s and punk just emerging from the woodwork, it was also possible that this was a one-sided appraisal by David, who himself had not been behaving in a gentlemanly way either. Ah, oh, the heady days of punk. What a wonderful self-image we wove for ourselves. I was 16 when it all kicked off. It was an, I was a nice middle-class boy with a penchant for drink, girls and a little organised violence i.e. rugby. I had a small income from daddy, so buying a pair of PVC trousers and fitting a mohair jumper with safety pins wasn't too difficult. In a stroke, I'd blended into a new crowd. We spent nights in dodgy bars, dance halls and dingy flats, dancing, drinking and occasionally smoking something stronger than number six cigarettes. I briefly made it to the heart of the scene uh, by becoming acquaintances with Nasty Phil, singer and harmonica player with the Edinburgh punk band The Cheaters. Nasty Phil wasn't that nasty after all, it turned out. He even had an Andrex puppy blonde Labrador. The nastiness came in when he used to get stoned with the puppy and laugh as the puppy staggered about off its tiny nut. Their classic lyric was, I don't want to be radioactive. A huge concern to all of us at the time. As young people growing up in the 1960s and 1970s, we'd passed through the first flush of the summer of love, which had quickly dissolved into the winter of discontent. My youth was studded with miners' strikes and ever-present possibilities that life on earth would end shortly. A few short years later, a friend of mine who had come into a large sum of money bought a house in London that featured an atomic bomb-proof shelter in the basement. When we're young, we rely upon the, the guidance system set by our parents, our schools and religion. The teenage years are about testing that theory. Some people pull on a tweed jacket like Dad. Some people a purple ripped mohair jumper not like Dad. Not to mention the spray-on trousers, the eyeliner and the donkey jackets. We tried to discover what we believe, if the diet we've been fed by the previous generation still makes sense. Punk was our personality crisis. It was our rage against the machine. Every generation invents a new way to express themselves and our trend was punk. As a generation, we viewed ourselves as anti-establishment. The establishment from before was still a hangover of the Second World War and from empire. By that time, however, people wanted peace and empire was seemingly outdated and ugly. That slice of anti-establishmentism has served me well. It's forced me to question so much about the middle-class public school values I was given. I didn't ask for, but was given nonetheless. In later years, it saw me question everything around climate change and the environment through a project called Positive TV. The search led me to question religion too. When we see the number of wars fought in the name of religion, then one quickly has to ask about the foundation of the belief system that would let this go on. From questioning religion, one quickly finds 
Quakerism and Buddhism. These thought systems seem to be more peace-loving in general. However, by this stage, I was analysing whether I wanted to be part of any system. The movement towards spirituality in the 90s sense, as opposed to the Victorian ideas of contacting the spirits, was a welcome path. The path seemed to have started in California, the home of LSD, the hippie revolution, uh, and a place, with a place with a large Chinese population. A blend of LSD opening the mind and Taoism's non-doctrinal openness started to spread. So many people from the USA and Europe had also ventured to India to look for teachers. This melting pot of information from the Upanishads and the Vedas joining the melting pot and forming spirituality. The basic teaching was, you are not, sorry, you are the source of everything. You no longer need to go through the filter of religion. This freed me from church, but it locked me into a new church, which was just slightly more open-minded. If you're following a guru of any sort, no matter what they're preaching, you still have the information filtered for you. As much as it looked like freedom, it was still a prison, just a kind of open prison. By declaring that I was aligning myself with the Tao in the 90s, and I was still following the teachings of Lao Tzu and Chang Tzu, the, de um, the detachment and the flow were still part of the dualistic nature of our universe. So here's where the personality crisis comes to the forefront. The more one digs into quantum physics, the more one looks at spirituality, the more one studies Qigong and Taoism, the more one starts to comprehend the underlying structure of the universe. Or the more one gets a tiny chink of an idea of how this might work, to think that we have it all would be insane. Slowly one realises that consciousness is the root of everything. From the basic understanding of the double slit experiment that requires uh, the observer to make it work, to the Californian ideas, you create your own reality. The underlying message is still the same. Your consciousness creates everything in this dualistic world. It's both good and bad news. If you focus, stay in the flow, don't separate yourself from nature, then you have a good thing, a good chance of things going your way. You have to be crazy to think that you have the power to actually manifest money into your bank account by tomorrow. Um, bending the universe to your will is not the game. Allowing the universe to flow you to the right place is the only game. Maybe the universe needs you to have a full bank account. Make sure that if you do get a sudden windfall, you use it wisely and in keeping with your life's mission, or it might just flow away again. To think that anything in your life has ever been wrong is total folly. Your relationship to your life's purpose is the only thing you may ever have done wrong. What the universe wants, it gets. If you ignore your calling, you'll get a warning shot across your bows. If you decide to become an arms dealer, eventually you'll get yours in the end. We call it karma. We know that if you're consistently being a bad person, then shit things will happen to you. But it's an ever more refined set of ideas. If you decide to work hard every day, drink hard every night, and then you're still going against the natural flow of your life. Something hideous like cancers lurk lurking around the corner. The universe has many rich and varied ways of telling you that you are off course. Let's look at another extreme. And here's your first clue. The universe doesn't do extremes. You decide that you want to dedicate your life to a religion, live in a monastery and never speak again. How many of these people are actually declaring enlightenment after 20 years on the mat? 
and how many gibber into old age home for priests? Would 99.9% .9 look like too small a figure to you? This life might seem glorious, but it's still 100% against the natural flow of things. Life's purpose. Here's the scenario. I give you a lovely house. I make sure you're fed and watered every day. I fill your bank account monthly so that you want for nothing. What would you like to do to fill your days? If the answer is sitting on the couch watching TV, then maybe we've got a little bit more work to do. Looks like I'm going to have to help you learn to listen inside, people. Freedom from all bonds. What would you do? Would you help street kids in Colombia? Send bicycles to Africa? Farm organic hemp in Kent? Work for the Environment Agency? Work for a charity? Work for a think tank to guide government policy on climate change? The ideas can be as small or as huge as you can imagine. The only thing you have to remember is to make sure the direction is true and that you stay connected and in the flow. As doors graciously open for you, you step through them carefully and thoughtfully. If the doors remain shut, then they were just not your doors. Be patient. Rome was not built in a day. As long as you feel happy, isn't that enough? Filling your working life with joy, you'll never work a day again. The only thing that can derail you from this process is your personality. So it's time you had your own personality crisis. Your ego will tell you, I'm not good enough to do that. I'll always have to work in this shit job to survive. I will never get out of debt. I'm not worth it. This path is just too dangerous for me. Every time a thought like that comes across the bows of your brain, stop. Catch the thought and analyse it. Maybe you'll have to start by recapping your day each evening, seeing where you made the mistakes and what you could have done better. As time goes by, you'll get better at catching these thoughts in motion. Ask yourself, who, inside of me, said that statement? Who thinks I'm not good enough? One of my students once said to me, when I can't meditate because of all the noise in my head, I try to, to pigeonhole all the voices, all the different people in there. I so got that. My dad, my teachers, my family, my friends, they'd all left voices in my head too. Voices that were all too happy to chirp in at the slight, slightest opportunity. This then is the crisis. You need to identify who's speaking, what past pattern triggered them, and start to find ways to break the idea down. Talk to that person, reason with them, tell them kindly you'll no longer respond to that idea and that you're just now going to ignore their advice. Hey, you never get it right first time. Sometimes it might take 100 times before you catch the idea. The ego can be very tricky. It dresses your dad up in different ways. And I don't mean tweed jacket or three-piece suit either. Just when you think that a pattern around anger that seems to have been picked up from your father's short temper has been dealt with, then it'll raise its ugly head in another way. Still, catch the thought. Spend a while looking for its root. And then you'll no doubt realise that it comes from the same root personality, just disguised in a different way. Be strong. Persevere. Where does your own personality crisis lead? Well, I'll let you know when I get there. However, I can say that with each passing day, it brings 
longer spells of happiness and joy. It makes life much more simple. The calmness that comes with the internal quiet is lovely. Ultimately, the suggestion is that one can find one's true self and abide in this unity consciousness state for longer and longer until who knows. One thing I can say is that you peel away these layers of personality. The trappings of daily life start to seem ridiculous. The millions of games that people play just to waste their waking hours. The reading, the researching, the gaming, the television, hours absorbed by one's mobile phone. Need I say more? The bliss of lockdown has been my deep reconnection with nature. I was given a great gift at the beginning of lockdown, some excellent quality Bose in-ear headphones. They lie on my desk, almost unused. These days I walk with a quiet mind. As thoughts appear, they suddenly seem like overdressed and over-made-up actors who have suddenly been pushed into the spotlight, but who have forgotten their lines or are a bit shy to get started. In the harsh light, clarity and silence, they're starting to look obvious and stupid. Large facets of society suddenly seem ridiculous. My life's work suddenly seems very clear and necessary. My boat has drifted gently into the middle of the stream and now is pointing down the river. Sure, there are still a few rocks under the water, maybe a few rapids to negotiate, but the river seems to get wider and deeper every day. I feel the presence and the power of the ocean slowly pulling me home.